This is CNN. Welcome to both sides. For the Democrats and for Ross Perot, a big week. The Democrats coming off with a convention that was uncharacteristically orderly. Perot coming off with an announcement that shocked everybody. First, a look back at Madison Square Garden. Friends in the Democratic Party, the American dream is not dead. We've got us a race between an aristocrat, an autocrat, and a Democrat. If we pursue that ethic, that love ethic, that care ethic, we will win and deserve to win. Stand tall, never surrender, keep hope alive. Because I love New York, because I love America, I nominate for the office of the President of the United States the man from Hope, Arkansas. I believe in my heart that together, Bill Clinton and I offer the American people the best chance we have as a nation to move forward in the right direction again. I proudly accept your nomination for President of the United States. Then, on the day of Bill Clinton's acceptance speech, Ross Perot's stunning announcement. I believe it would be disruptive for us to continue our program, since this program would obviously put it in the House of Representatives and be disruptive to the country. In the states, so therefore I will not become a candidate. What will Perot's withdrawal mean this turbulent campaign year? Is Clinton electable, and can he govern? Can George Bush pull out of his tailspin? Frank Farnkoff, you're a former head of the Republican Party. Can George Bush manage to pull it out this time? Oh, absolutely, Jess. We're, we're ready for, a, I think, a, a great campaign. Uh, although I've got to tell you, right now, I think the Clinton and Bush uh, strategists are around a conference table, both, of, both teams somewhere, because, you know, we elect an electoral college basis, and uh, everyone was gearing for a three-man electoral college race. It's back to two, and I think George Bush will be favored in that race. Senator John Bro, you're head of the Democratic Leadership Council, a strong Clinton backer. What's your side? Well, Jesse, I think that not only do we have the comeback kid in Bill Clinton, we have the comeback party. I mean, we unite the Rainbow Coalition with the Democratic Leadership Council and the Perot supporters. We got a winning ticket in November. Also with us, the head of the Small Business Administration, former Republican congressman from Hawaii, Patricia Psyche. Time Magazine and CNN are giving Clinton a 20-point lead over Bush. 67% of the voters ask, say, Bush will lose because Clinton will win. What are you going to do as Republicans to offset the Bush slide? Well, first of all, let's not believe polls. This is only July. And I think you, I can recall many other conventions where other Democrat candidates had a real high. So let's settle down. But what we've got to do here is talk in terms of what the two candidates have to offer. And when the voters find out that Mr. Clinton is suggesting a $154 billion tax increase and a $220 billion spending budget, I think they're going to get but, serious. But when you say don't, don't believe polls, would you rather be 20 points down or 20 points up? Oh, certainly I'd rather be 20 points up, but don't count it now. <laughs> <laughs> Doesn't bother me now. Well, Pat, I think that's the old way of Republicans running against Democrats. You did it four years ago and eight years ago, but it's a different Democratic Party. It's one that is moving towards the middle and still maintaining the traditional coalition of Democratic support. It's different. It can't, you can't use the same rhetoric that you used four years ago. Oh, well, 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 I, I, I like you to say it's, it's old wine now in young bottles. That's about the only difference. <laughs> but the, the, see, the problem is it seems that there's tremendous economic pain. The crisis is around the rising unemployment and plants closing and all of that. Will Bush fight back with an economic plan or will it be with dirt? 
Well, I think what you're going to see is both candidates. Uh, I mean, uh, coming out of the convention, uh, there was a, a platform adopted. I, I happen to think probably that Bill Clinton will run on the economic plan he put forward perhaps a little closer than the actual platform. And I think you're going to see in our convention, George Bush come forward with his economic plan. And the American people are going to, are going to have an opportunity to compare the two, along with the experience and quality of the candidates for the job, and make a good judgment well, Frank, in November. When you look at 10 million people unemployed, numbers rising, plants closing everywhere, we're exporting capital and, and jobs, I mean, what will be your plan? Well, there's a plan already out there. You know, oh, yeah. you're, you're deep concerned about the inner city. As you know, uh, George Bush has had uh, uh, an enterprise zone plan on the Hill for, for four years. The Democratic Congress won't move it. There is no way, you love to talk about employees, jobs. There's no way to have employees without having employers. And in order to have employers, you have to have business that will come forth with capital investment and make the, that investment to build a plant that will employ people. And in order to do that, you've got to create the climate through some tax incentive for those individuals to go forward. Now, he, he's suggesting that we've lost 22 GM plants and 74,000 jobs because of lack of enterprise zones. Well, I, I didn't quite that far. <laughs> <laughs> Talk to me. The frustration that out, is out there in America, Jesse, and I think is because people are unhappy with politicians and politics in general. And now the person who represents the status quo in the White House is the person who's been there for 12 years. George Bush has been vice president for eight years and president for four. And I think the American people say he's had his chance. We're still going in circles. There's no plan. There's no sense of direction. I want something to change. Perot was very popular because he represented change. With him gone, the only candidate that can really say, I want to change things in the White House, is Bill Clinton. Well, it's it's, it's it's a, a, a part of what happened coming out of New York. When you see John Bro sitting here coming very close to me, still on the right, <laughs> and we came out of that part of the convention together, it was because Clinton put forth a four-year, $200 billion plan to reinvest in our country, to cut the military budget without cutting the fence, for universal head start for mothers and children, basically, and raise the minimum wage for working people. It seems to go to the heart of the economic pain in the country. Will Bush come up with a comparable pain, plan to address well, the pain? first of all, we do want change, but I think the change should be in the Congress. That's where the change should occur, so that we can have a Congress that's going to work with the President. Now, when we talk in terms of an economic plan, the President has one. He has worked on it for a long time. It's been uh, refuted. It's been dismissed by the Democrat Congress. One of the biggest, most important areas is, of course, in bank reform. The Congress refuses to face up to making our banking institutions competitive domestically and internationally. So we've got a capital crunch. Now the president has been through many programs, been carrying out long-term investment proposals. Also we have venture capital that we would like to increase risk but, capital. And wait a minute, Jesse, we have programs to encourage minority investments. Now these programs are already on the books, they're working, the president is committed to them and we're going to be moving ahead. He doesn't have to develop a whole new You're suggesting plan. the Democratic Congress has fallen, that the president at, at this point is in trouble? Pat, one of the problems is the president sits back with the veto pen. We've had 20 good programs sent to the president, and the only thing he does is just puts an X through it and puts it back in the trash. Well, you that, I mean, know, the Congress Senator? is acting. The Congress is doing some things, but the president is sitting there vetoing them. John, you, you know, know you very know, well what, what, that what, you even, people even, are intending to e do that. Even with the president shift taking that place position. right now, it seems that the issue is revolving around who has an economic plan to address. It seems the most stunning uh, blow to Bush so far has been the rising unemployment numbers the last few weeks. Th that's always that the has case, nothing though. to do with the enterprise zones or vetoes or nothing. Well, certainly it does. In, in, other, in order to get the economy back uh, cooking, uh, we're at, at, what, John, about a 2% growth rate. We would like to see it get up to about a 4% growth rate. You've got to have stimulus to the economy. The way you've got to stimulate this economy is give those individuals in the private enterprise sector initiative to go out and make investment in capital, equipment, they then provide jobs. You don't create jobs, you know, just out of the air. And promises, promises, promises in any campaign speech, whether it's at a convention or out on the trail, isn't going to do it. You're 100% right. The American people are sick and tired and frustrated of politics as usual. And what they're going to demand from both George Bush 
and uh, the uh, Democratic nominee, Mr. Clinton, is for them to face these issues but directly. Bush's and make plan a has not created the jobs that he promised. What happened? He couldn't get it passed through a Democratic Congress, which in my view, and I've been around this town and, and, and politics uh, nationally in this country for a long time, I've never seen quite as partisan a Congress uh, as the Democrats have had in the last two sessions. Now, they're frustrated. They want the White House back. So, so, and I so, think so that that's solution, been at the heart of it. Your solution is to break the gridlock, right? Got to break the gridlock. So if you have a Democratic president, a Democratic Congress, no more gridlock. Well, you know, we tried that one, so Jesse, <laughs> remember, <laughs> I can remember the day that Ronald Reagan was sworn in after four years of Democratic control of both houses and the White House. You know what the prime rate was? 21.5. Inflation of 13 and a half. So, you know, we could go on and on. We tried that. Let's try a Republican president and a Republican Congress, and let's see what we can accomplish. Twelve years is a long time to stuff under you guys. <laughs> we'll be right back. The Clinton-Bush confrontation. Heads up. It seems that nobody's in the middle. We'll be right back. There's a movement in this country to surrender the Second Amendment. Listen to this. There is no reason for anyone in this country, anyone except a police officer or a military person, to buy, to own, to have, to use a handgun. And still quoting. The only way to do that is to change the Constitution. That's not some nobody. That's the president of NBC News. You see, they want to repeal your constitutional right to keep and bear arms. Well, you can help stop it by joining the NRA. For just $25, you'll get a year of great magazines and member benefits, and you'll be where all honest gun owners belong, in the NRA. If you want to keep the rights your founding fathers entrusted to you, the rights the Constitution guarantees to you. The rights the NRA protects for you. Oh, no. Attention, inventors. Receive free confidential forms and useful information on how to launch a new product, innovation, or just an idea by calling the Inventors Helpline in Washington, D.C. at 800-227-7000. Call now and you'll also receive a free brochure describing how you can participate in the invention process. Don't wait. Our free Inventors Package will get you going in the right direction. Call 800-227-7000. Good morning. So Are you tired of morning news shows that give you everything but the news? Big events happening overseas, but first... Is your pet psychic? We'll find out. Wake up to headline news for the latest news, business, and sports around the clock. The number one cause of death for babies under one is respiratory disease. The number one cause of hope is the American Lung Association. Please help us. It's a matter of life and breath. We're talking about presidential politics and the week that was. The former Republican chairman, Frank Farenkoff, Democratic Leadership Council Chair, John Brewer of Louisiana, Patricia Psyche, Bush Backer, and head of the Small Business Administration. Frank, on the, this arrangement, can President Bush afford Dan Quayle? Well, I think, you know, the, uh, any president uh, and presidential nominee has the uh, right and privilege to choose uh, the, their own running mate. The president made a decision four years ago to run with Dan Quayle. Uh, he's very satisfied and pleased with the job that the vice president has done. Uh, and from every indication that I've seen, uh, he's going to keep the ticket together. Uh, and uh, George Bush and Dan Quayle will face the American vote. Do you support that arrangement? I do. I'm a former party chairman. I'm a, I'm a strong supporter of the president and vice president. But Frank, don't you think that maybe he would be much happier if he had a, a Jack Kemp on that ticket or a Jim Baker on that ticket? Wouldn't that be a stronger ticket? Well, if, if, if he felt that way, that's an easy, easy change to make. Uh, all he has to do, if that was the president's feeling, uh, would be to uh, make that uh, a nomination. I don't think it's going to happen. The, the, said the, the read is that, uh, that perhaps Baker and Cheney and Powell are coming in and, and Quill is going out. Is that just kind well, of you know, clothing talk? This town uh, was full of rumors. Uh, uh, because of that Wyoming fishing trip uh, between uh, the President and Secretary of State. Uh, none of us yet know uh, what happened uh, up on that trout stream, uh, but uh, uh, I think that's probably what developed uh, the talk that was going back and forth. But I expect the team to be together. You know what I'd like to know? Uh, I'd like to ask John whether if Mr. Perot had dropped out earlier, would Mr. Clinton have selected Mr. Gore and kept it a Southern 
Southern team. Well, I think the ticket would have been the same. I think that Al Gore uh, is from the South, which helps us in the South, but he doesn't have the reputation nationally of being from the South because he's campaigned nationally. I think it's a perfectly balanced ticket. It's one that I think uh, is balanced uh, from a philosophical standpoint as far as what Al Gore has been involved in international affairs. He's solid in that area, and I think it brings a lot of help to Bill Clinton. But John, John, this is the, the second <clears throat> ticket in a row for the Democratic Party in a presidential race that I think most Americans think is turned on its head, is upside down. And by that I mean that the strength of the ticket is in the vice presidential slot. You had that with Benson and Dukakis four years ago. I think a vast number of people think that Gore is a stronger candidate and that he was picked by the governor to really cover up flaws in his candidacy. Uh, well, the state of Arkansas, let, let me just finish and I'll let you respond. The state of Arkansas has a dismal record in the environment. What does he do? He goes out and finds someone who who has a record in the environment. Uh, he, there, questions have been raised in the press about his failure to go to Vietnam. He finds someone who did uh, face the hard choice and go to Vietnam. Questions about family raised in the, in the press. He goes out and finds Al and Tipper Gore and those marvelous kids, marvelous family. So, you know, what you've, you've got here is, I think, the, the governor choosing someone to cover up for his own deficiency. Fighting, as, fighting words. <laughs> I want you to know that's something we can't accuse your team of being uh, flip-flopped around. Uh, it's no question that Dan Coyle should not be at the top of the ticket. There's a lot of people who question whether he should be at the second half of the ticket as well. But it, what you've described is a good ticket. It's a ticket that, in fact, is balanced, that has expertise in the things that the other person would like to have more help and assistance in. That's a good, solid ticket, in my opinion. But you know what's the big stuff is not just that. We're in a kind of international disgrace. Economically, we go to Japan, give us a break. We go to Rio on a, in a very defensive position. It looks like Hussein will outlast Bush. What are we doing to turn around the country? I mean, the real big thing that makes a difference to people. Well, and I, you, your point's very well put, because I think what, what we have to look at is what are the qualifications to be president of the United States, and what sort of experience do we need uh, in that job? I think you have a presidential nominee of the Democratic Party uh, who has practically no foreign policy international experience. I listened to his speech very carefully the other night. It was pretty long, but it was only, I think, at, at 53 minutes, at about minute 49, that foreign policy was even mentioned. It was one or two sentences there. You know, the world is not totally uh, at peace. Uh, we live in difficult times. Sure, the wall has fallen and, and, and that evil empire no longer exists, but there's trouble, as we know, in, in Yugoslavia, Czechoslovakia. Uh, we need someone there with that experience. Well, Frank, I think we've got a weak candidate. Let me tell you, Democrats people say. outside of Washington where we're here today are saying, look, what has this experience gotten us? It's gotten us this high rate of uh, unemployment. We've got a country economically that is in shambles over here. The president is spending more time worrying about how the conditions are in the old Soviet Union and let's take care of Russia. That's where the experience has gotten us. They want somebody that knows what the problems are here in the United States of America. Spe speaking about dissatisfied people, we'll be right back and talk about the parole voters. Stay with us. Put another nickel in. Time Life Music announces your hit parade. All your favorite songs of the 40s and 50s. Music, music, music. Hey there. Year by year, you'll hear the original hits by America's best loved artists. Don't let the stars get in your eyes, don't let the moon break your heart. They the music of your memories, sounding fresher than ever in digital sound. To young. Start your sentimental journey with 1945. 24 original hits, just $9.99 for double-length cassettes, $11.99 for two LPs or compact disc. Gonna take a sentimental journey to renew old memory. I'm happy go, happy go. Drinking rum and Coca-Cola. You belong to my heart. Then you'll have the opportunity to audition other great albums. So call now for this special introductory price. I say I'll did you later, baby, in the USA. Here's how to order. 
Call 1-800-854-4900. That's 1-800-854-4900. Or send just $9.99 for one double-length cassette or $11.99 for two records or one compact disc. Plus $3.50 shipping and handling to Hit Parade 1945, P.O. Box 1880, Department 2, Alexandria, Virginia. Ross Perot rocked the political process this week in a way that shocked everyone and angered many of his supporters. A new Time magazine CNN poll says 41% of Perot's voters could cross over to Bill Clinton, 20% going over to George Bush. Frank Ferencall, what would be the effect of these Perot voters on the Bush quail campaign? I, I think right now they're, they're probably key. Um, the uh, deciding factor in this race may be where, where, those, folks, uh, where those folks land. Uh, I think, uh, but their effect is even going to be greater than that, Jesse. I think the whole Perot movement uh, will impact both political parties and will impact uh, voters who have been turned off and that 50 percent who hasn't even participated in the process for a number of years. Uh, they're going to look very, very closely at Bill Clinton. But and, two of and three of these voters were Bush supporters who were turned off from Bush because of the economic calamity. Well, that, that, I, don't, I haven't seen anything to, to indicate that. These people have been turned off because they're, uh, they just don't like politics as usual. They've been turned off not only with George Bush, but with the Congress of the United States, the gridlock in Washington. They're tired of rhetoric. They're tired of people who make promises and don't, and don't perform. And I think that they are going to create a consciousness among not only the Pearl people, but, but, but other voters. But asking these, for these were former defense workers and, and, uh, and family farmers. These are people who move to the suburbs who right now cannot afford to pay their house note. I mean, well, it, no, it, that's it, not true, Jesse. Is, is that an economic no, message? No, you're for wrong. That? You're absolutely wrong. If you, an analysis of, uh, of the Pearl voters show that they didn't fit that category at all. They're, those people were in that category. It cut across the spectrum. Right, right, American I tell voters. you one thing. Those parole voters had made one decision already, and that is they didn't like the way things were being run in the White House. That's why they went and created a new candidate. And they've already made the decision. They don't like what's been there for the last four years. That's why they're not with Bush. Well, but they also made a decision not to go with Clinton. No, it's a and big that's difference. That's why they're over there. The big difference is they don't know Bill Clinton yet because he's just come onto well, the national scene. You know, George I've, Bush I've has been, been there 12 years. They don't know Bill Clinton. They don't know <clears throat> Bill Clinton. Now, that's not the case. He's been out there running for office. He's Everyone been, knows he's been Bill in Clinton. Arkansas. No one's probably government. been more exposed. Exposed. But you know, I understand that Mr. Perot is gathering the leaders of his movement to look at the possibility of developing a platform. Now, I think that's very positive because these people have their own ideas of what government should be all about. And I encourage it because when it gets to the final analysis, they're going to find that their thinking is more with Mr. Bush than with Mr. Clinton. We heard on Larry King's show more than a platform. We really heard talking about a third party, about mobilizing his, his state leaders, yeah. keeping his petitions on the wraps, developing a platform, that's and if neither party listens, his name remains on the ballot. Frank, that sounds more like third party than just platform. Yeah, it, it, it could be. I, I heard today that he might not uh, want his name withdrawn and, and leave it on, which would create uh, problems for the Clinton and Bush strategists again. You know, we can't ever forget, and also when we look at these polls, we don't elect our president on popular vote in this country. It's done by the Electoral College. Uh, and therefore, it is an electoral college strategy that's developed. That's why a poll today, 20 points one way or another, really doesn't mean that. Right, that must scare you to death to think that it would go into the Democratic-controlled House of Representatives to have that decision. Made. Oh, it won't go there. Not now. It, it, the American people are going to decide this, and, and I'm convinced they're going to go for George Bush when all is said and done. Cause but when Ross Perot identifies this, John, into a, a third part of the movement, what does that mean to you strategically? I tell you, one of the things that it means to us that it's easier to win, particularly in the South, I think. If he's still on the ballot in the southern states, I clearly think he's taking votes away from uh, George Bush in Texas, for instance, and right across the South. And with the traditional Democratic coalition, I think we're in much better shape. But you know, Mr. Perot has very We'll be right back, right okay. back with some pardon <laughs> shots. Right. We'll be right back. I'm Officer Lisa Hale, Vice President of the Crime Prevention Association of Michigan. This year, over 1.5 million motor vehicles will be stolen. Stolen from shopping centers, workplaces, even from your own driveways. As a police officer, it's my duty to protect you as well as your personal possessions. So if you don't want your car or truck to be stolen, here are a few tips to remember. One, always remove your keys from the ignition. Two, double check to make sure that your doors are locked. 
Three, at night, park in a well-lit area. Four, never leave packages or personal belongings exposed on seats. And five, never leave your car without first protecting it with the club. The club is a tough-tempered steel bar that can't be cut. Once attached, it makes driving your car virtually impossible. I personally use and recommend the club to help prevent auto thefts. It's affordable protection that you can't afford to be without. Remember to avoid cheap imitations. Make sure the anti-theft device you buy says the club on the handle. The clubs available at most stores where auto supplies are sold. Some car wash products may say wax on the label, but watch this dramatic comparison to tannery wash and wax on the car. Tannery wash and wax is an amazing one-step formulation that applies a long-lasting polysilicone finish as it washes away even tough road film. He's using the leading wax car wash. She's using tannery wash and wax. Now for the rinsing. Look, the tannery side is beating. With tannery wash and wax, you simply wash your car and it's waxed. It really works. When you want to watch the news, you turn to CNN. But did you know we're much more? Like coverage of the world's financial markets. Style, decoration, design, and beauty. All the sports, scores, and highlights. Debate from a different perspective. Talk that'll thrill you. Showbiz, from Hollywood to Broadway. Tantalizing cuisine. Advice you can count on. The world's weather. The pros and the cons. CNN, we're the news you need and much more. Let's get some parting shots. So Frank, what's going to make the difference in the short run with this 20-point 20, 20 gap? I think what uh, the president has to do now is uh, uh, put forth uh, his uh, rare qualifications for the tough job of being president and the leader of the free world and draw a very, very clear comparison uh, to that of the governor of Arkansas. Uh, and I think if he's, if he's able to do that and he sets forth those qualifications and his positions clearly, it'll make the difference not only in the short run but also in the long run. What must Clinton do in the short run to sustain this? this lead. Well, Jesse, people in America, I think, are fed up with two things. Number one, the status quo and with politicians in general. And I think they clearly now understand that George Bush represents the status quo. He's been there for 12 years and that Bill Clinton is not just another politician. I think he's proven that in the primary season that we just went through. Congresswoman Sankey? In the short run and the long run, the president's economic package is going to be able to stand on its own. People are going to understand that the president has done job creation. I want to thank you, Mr. Psyche, and to you, Frank Farrenkopf, to you, Senator Bro. The political scene is turbulent. Economic pain, insecurity, and fear abound, affecting workers, farmers, black, brown, white, suburbanites, and city dwellers. We are now exporting jobs and capital and consuming everything from toasters to TVs, cosmetics to cars. Our leaders must help us, not anger us, not depress us and polarize us with race-baiting schemes and human neglect. We need real solutions to real problems. Right now, we need our candidates to set a moral tone for the country. Spare us the dirt and establish an economic debate. The American people deserve a campaign that heals and rebuilds right now. Thanks for hearing both sides. For a transcript of Both Sides with Jesse Jackson, send $4 to Journal Graphics Incorporated, 1535 Grant Street, Denver, Colorado, 80203, or call 303-831-9000. Do you ever feel like you've been riding a bicycle with square wheels? Now, thanks to an innovation in bicycling, you can ride with greater comfort and safety. Introducing Wonder Ride, a shock absorber specially designed for bicycles. Wonder Ride absorbs the bumps and jolts that come up through the bicycle frame before they reach the rider. The result is a more stable ride. Wonder Ride is easy to install. Simply remove the existing seat post, attach to the seat clamp, then reinsert into the frame. Riding a bicycle is one of the healthiest exercises, so don't let road shock take all the fun out of it. Wonder Ride comes in three weight ranges. Order today for only $19.95. Here's how.
Have your credit card ready and call toll-free 1-800-257-1257. That's 1-800-257-1257. Or send 1995 plus 495 shipping to Wonder Ride, PO Box 8250, Atlanta.